My name is Hatsi Jorgen Schnorr. I uh, was an LLM student back in 1990. And uh, after this, uh, I took the bar in New York. And now I'm in private practice in Germany with offices uh, in uh, Frankfurt and in uh, Leipzig. I do a lot of international work, but also domestic business law. I'm Richard Goldstein from South Africa, a retired justice of the South African Constitutional Court and a former chief prosecutor of the United Nations Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and I'm now teaching in various law schools in the United States. I'm Joe Smallhuber. I'm an American trained, but also French and Austrian and German trained lawyer. I practice law in France, where I've been now for the last 30 years. Uh, my name is Winfried van der Wauschenberg. I'm uh, a practicing advocaat, as we say in the Netherlands, for 31 years, and I've been practicing for about 20 years, more or less exclusively in, in transactional practice, and uh, the last 10 years a focus on international litigation and disputes. Catherine Baradona, and I'm a 1990 George graduate. I've practiced in the UK as a UK solicitor private practice. I'm a California licensed lawyer. have also worked for an international investment bank and I'm currently with an international developmental institution based in Washington, D.C. I am Fernando Pombo. I practice as an avocado lawyer in Spain, in Madrid, with the firm that uh, I started in 1971. So my, my personal practice in law in Spain has been uh, for more than 40 years now exercise as a lawyer. I was also the president until uh, 2009 of the International Bar Association. Hi, I'm Carol Mates. Um, I've been a uh, practicing I'm a U.S. lawyer, New York and Massachusetts licensed, and I started off my practice in private practice in New York and then was with a large multinational U.S. bank and then spent almost 30 years with an international development organization that focused on practice of transactions in emerging markets. Based upon your experience in transnational practice, what added skills and knowledge beyond simply knowledge of potentially relevant international and foreign laws and beyond the basic skills of legal analysis and the like that are necessary for all attorneys, what added skills and knowledge are necessary for attorneys to effectively deal with foreign lawyers and foreign litigants in the context of transnational business practice or transnational litigation? Answer number one would be language. Answer number two would be language. And answer number three would, you guess it, language again. I mean this in a broader sense, not just linguistically, but also in a sense of understanding foreign cultures, customs, the way of thinking, thinking, the social structure, the economy, and so forth and so on. I think language is important, but not, not in the purely linguistic sense. In fact, I think it's, it's something else entirely different. I would say um, um, social and sociological intuition. The, uh, it's, when we talk about the, uh, Churchill's statement, in fact, about Britain and the United States, about being two people separated by a common language, um, if you're not sensitive, even in the same language, but different cultures, to the different use of language, you can get very, very, very confused. When, when a, a, an American attorney says to his client, you should consider doing um, X, Y, or Z, he means something entirely different than when the British solicitor says to his client, you should consider doing X, Y, and Z. One is a, one is a suggestion, the other is a very strong but politely worded command. Um, and you. You need to, that's that simple type of difference. If you're not at least sensitive to the fact that people use their language culturally totally differently, can get you into an extraordinary difficult problem. Well, in my view, what is extremely important is that apart from your own knowledge about your domestic law, you need at least to have an understanding uh, of the system of the other legal system where you are working. That, that's nowadays easy on internet, that was in the past a bit more difficult, but it's extremely important that you understand structures. And then indeed, in addition to that, the knowledge of the business culture, how do people interact, what is expected. If you're practicing as a lawyer, 
you're a service provider. What do people expect from a service provider? Uh, the way the service provider, the lawyer, should act, should react, the time in which he should react. That's very important. And last but definitely not least, in general, cultural differences, especially if you travel to uh, continents not like Europe or the United States, but with total different cultures, uh, it is extremely important that you know at least the basic, uh, under the, the basic ways in which people interact, what behavior is and what behavior is not uh, acceptable. So that has nothing to do with the law, but just with how do you get your message across, how can you interact with the people, how can you make your clients or your other lawyers with whom you work in a team uh, ask the right questions to you and how can you ask them the right questions. Africa is a very good example, in a completely different uh, uh, way, if you think in Latin America, uh, certainly Latin America having basically a civil law uh, originated the legal system and lots of traditions as well, and you will have to follow their practices, traditions, uh, the uh, style of administering uh, justice, uh, the way uh, justice is applied, the, the way you have access to uh, the court system, uh, for that to work, be it in Brazil or in Peru or in Bolivia, in a major also international project. Understanding the way they work, understanding their possibilities, and certainly in most of the cases, understanding their language, or a language which is not necessarily English. When setting up the first international, truly international prosecutor's office, uh, we got people from 40 countries, each coming with their own uh, legal systems, and we had to really uh, create from, from scratch a new international prosecutorial uh, uh, system, procedures, language, uh, in, in debates with judges who, uh, who came from different systems. So I think, I think one, one must develop uh, in the international field, certainly which I've worked, uh, a wide understanding uh, of different uh, cultures, uh, a respect for them, uh, listening to people. One of the things I, I worry about a lot is what, what's the court system like? It's not a question of actually knowing the law. But what's the court system like in that other jurisdiction? Do they have jury trials? Is it entirely professional judges? Is it a mixed bag of professionals and, and, and lay people who sit on the court? Um, how, does the, how does the case happen? Do you have, do you have uh, uh, witnesses who, who, uh, who are sworn under oath, or, or, or are they simply, or is it entirely a, a, a procedure under paper? On paper, that will make a difference then on how you draft the contract and how you negotiate it, where the burden of proof might be, how you're going to prove your case if it's a litigation. Um, get some of that. Get at the very outset some of that basic knowledge that will then that you can then ask the lawyers on the other side to help you fill it in. But have something in that case a cultural basis because the courts are, by the way, I think you know in a one sense in a, in a cultural sense much more profoundly cultural than. Than, than the difference in the laws. Generally, generally, at least in the, in, in the West, um, whether you're in a civil law tradition or a common law tradition, the answer is the big global picture answer is going to be pretty much the same. We recognize contract. We recognize private property. We recognize marriage. We recognize. But what the devil, the devil will be in the detail of how you form a contract, but that's something you can learn relatively easy. What you have to understand is how the rest of the society functions in the dispute resolution method. How does, you know, um, I've never heard a French lawyer say the, the, the kind of the phrase that I really love in English, see you in court. Uh, uh, never heard that because uh, the cultural prejudice is totally against that. For example, where reasonableness and fairness, uh, a judge has wide powers to amend the context, to set clearly stipulated contractual provisions aside because in this given situation it's unreasonable and unfair. If, if you discuss that attitude towards contract with lawyers in Central Europe where indeed it's written or it's not written, they, they, they cannot understand. They, they, they. My understanding is in the civil law system, judges, it's, it's a branch of school. And so you study and most judges have not practiced. And I think that that's an, an enormous difference um, 
in terms of how the judges see the world. And I would say one thing that I have learned to keep in mind is that um, judges are often very poorly paid and subject to corruption and political pressure. Uh, I, I remember being approached by three common law prosecutors shortly before the first trial began in the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And they said to me, we have a problem in preparing the case. There, there was a London barrister who said, according to his professional rules, he is not allowed under pain of unprofessional conduct to interview a witness before the witness is called to give evidence, because that, that's the job of the solicitor, the, and, and he could be disbarred. There was a Scottish barrister, he said, it's worse for me, he said, because in Scotland, not only is it unprofessional, but it's a criminal offence for a barrister to interview a witness before calling the witness in court, and, and, and I can end up in prison. And the American prosecutor said, in my system, it's unprofessional not to interview, and, and it would be gross negligence not to interview. What do we do? Early on in my practice, um, one of my colleagues was uh, a, a woman from Macau, and we were discussing an investment in the Philippines, and the project sponsor had uh, been in jail. And I said, oh, I don't think we should do business with this guy. And she turned to me and said, Carol, that's the problem with, your, with you Americans. You assume because somebody went to jail that he was a bad guy. What happens if the government just didn't like him? And that was a real shock to me. And, and mm -hmm. even before you get to the judiciary, when you're putting together the transaction, yeah. you have to be very careful to ask questions of your counterparties because the local attorney will do sometimes exactly what you've asked them to do, but they won't tell you that it's not going to achieve the result that you're hoping to achieve unless you specifically ask them. Sometimes they, you know, they'll, they'll fill in the forms, they'll write in the clauses, and unless you say, and do you think that that would be enforceable, they won't speak up and say, hardly. No. I remember years ago when I started, one of our senior partners had assisted a large American bank in a big arbitration and successful. And the morning, and there was an appeal possibility in that arbitration, and the morning he received a letter from the bank. They thanked him a lot, but they decided that another firm should handle the appeal. So we were all disappointed. We said, well, what's, what's, what's wrong? He said, well, I'm afraid I made a mistake. I treated the client as if I would have treated a Dutch client. And especially in those days, Dutch clients would like to have not too much contact with the lawyer. The work should be done, the less phone calls, the less letters, but the work well done, everybody happy. And this general counsel said, the thing is, you did a great job, but I felt all the time uncomfortable. I never heard from you, you did not immediately react to my letters or to my mails, and the quality is top, but the service is not what we expect. That, that was about 30 years ago. I always remembered it, and there is indeed a big difference in expectation how people interact. The United States is a typical lawyer paradise in a way, where a number of lawyers are practicing very service-minded. Uh, you didn't return my call. Uh, you will not hear that in a number of European countries, let alone in Africa or Arab countries, where time has a different notion, and you, you have to adapt. So if you don't know about the legal, let's say the business legal culture, you can fail where in, in from a legal point of view you did an outstanding job. We had a business meeting in Poland. It has been arranged uh, a couple of months ago and he showed up and nobody was there. The reason why is that it's customary for Poles to confirm a meeting, to reconfirm it and to re reconfirm it. It's not only necessary to, to think like a, for, a foreign lawyer, but it's enough to, to understand to know that he thinks differently. And then to have a basic understanding of in what, in what way it is different, it's differently, and try to get as close as possible to come to terms. I say to my students flippantly, but, but I don't, but it's not all that flippant, that when they're dealing with a different legal culture, they have to approach it as if everything that they know is wrong. Um, they have their basis in law, they have their, their own cultural intuitions, but they, unless they've spent years in that other culture, if they believe based on that what's going to happen over on the other side of the border, they're going to fail to advise their client properly, they'll fail to prosecute the case properly, they won't have 
done what they need to do. So you need to have, I think, this a real sensitivity to um, and flexibility about the about the other culture.